everyone, it's Doug here from the Point of Sale Data Minute and Crunchbox. We're here with another Point of Sale Data Minute live on LinkedIn, YouTube, and turning this into a podcast. Really excited to get started with today's episode. It's called Simplifying Amazon for Business Leaders. I have Guillaume Biero joining me today. He's an expert in the world of Amazon. He has his own Amazon consulting business. We'll bring him on screen now. Thanks for joining us, Guillaume. Nice to have you here. Pleasure being here, Dad. Thanks for the invitation. Oh, no, this is going to be great. Now, Guillaume and I first met when he was working with a uh, toy manufacturer, and he was the global Amazon lead. So I'm really excited to get into this a little bit today and also keep it high level for our VP of sales who, you know, think they're on Amazon and now or they know they're on Amazon, but they think like the sales are going to come rolling in. And the one thing that I've learned over the last five years and the more I get connected with folks on on LinkedIn who are Amazon experts like yourself is it's not that easy. So there's lots of challenges when it comes to doing business with Amazon. And today we want to dig into those just a little bit, some common themes, some common misconceptions that you see brands have and some things they do that they could do a lot, a lot better. So what I'd love to do, though, is if you could just give a little bit of an intro on your uh, consulting business and just kind of background with Amazon, and then we'll, we'll dig into it a little bit just to bring the viewer up to speed. Yeah, so um, so I've 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 been with I, I've worked with Amazon for about five six years. I'm not I'm not the typical retail guy. I've I've spent most of my career in in banking. So I started off with 15 years in banking, and then I moved into uh, distribution and then digital sales. So what I where I I got my experience was basically to launch about 20 brands in the uh, in the toys business for a, a very good and very reputable toy manufacturer here in Montreal. So we built the Amazon business from scratch. Uh, from you know, they were both domestic and direct import um, uh, setup, if you will. And we we built this with my team over four years. We did about a hundred million bucks of sales across sixteen countries. And we've you know we've tried to figure out our way in this uh, black Amazon box that I call right because nobody really knows the entire integrity of the entirely of this box. Everyone knows its little pieces, whether it's it's on purpose or not with Amazon. Uh, but we worked our way through it, and uh, we, we 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 did it. So and and when I came to realize while doing that is that there were a lot of help in the U.S. for the, these same type of companies, but not much uh, expertise with the black box business, the Amazon business in Canada. And I'm based in Montreal and especially not in French, right? So uh, so there was a gap in the market and the you know, people started approaching me to help them out. So this is what we've been doing for uh, the past uh, two, three years. Yeah, no, it's, it's, your experience is fascinating. So I deal with hundreds of suppliers every year, some as customers, some as prospects, and we always end up talking about Amazon. But and I'm excited to have you here today because no one in my network has this global experience, right, of launching in, I think you said, 16 different countries. And we will we'll mm -hmm. dig into Canada a bit because you're in Montreal, I'm in Toronto, we love talking about Amazon.ca. And to your point, I don't think it gets enough airtime because everyone is focused on the behemoth down south, the .com URL, and, and getting their products on there. What... Yeah. Uh, in your experience, how challenging has it been or do you see different challenges in the .ca market versus the .com market or the .uk market? Where do you think uh, the .ca market stands from that standpoint? Yeah, I think unfortunately Canada is one of the toughest ones to, to operate in when you compare it with uh, the UK, EU and the US. I mean, it's going to be probably no surprise to your listeners. Uh, you know, uh, we have Canada has about a tenth of the technology that US has. Um, there's pros and cons for Canada. I think uh, I think more cons than pros, unfortunately. I think the biggest challenge in my view for Canada is the North American Fulfillment Network, which allows, uh, which allowed, because uh, because there's rumors or 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 talks that they're going to shut it down. But I still goods still flow up uh, north. Uh, the challenge with Canada is on the retail prices for goods, right? So what happened? So in, in, my, in my world, when we launched um, items in the U.S., so relationship with Amazon.com, uh, they imported either they direct import or domestically sourced goods 
as a 1P, there's a way for my vendors, obviously, to move them up north through NAFN. And my gut has always told me that the, the, this, in this setup, the Canadian business doesn't know the cost of the item that's being imported from the U.S. So what happens then is that the retail price in Canada is everywhere. It's up the wazoo or it's very, <laughs> very low. So right. from a competitive standpoint in Canada, and it's the same story, I think, for Mexico, by the way. It's, it's sometimes very difficult to get to the correct retail and then, and then build a business in Canada, right? So these are kind of the, the uh, kind of examples of how challenging the Canadian environment could be. It, it can also flip the other way around, right? You can have an item. I used to have toys selling in the U.S., moving up to Canada, and the retails were so low. I had to call the vendor manager and tell these guys, listen, this is long-term, short-term gain for me, long-term pain for all of us. Right. Uh, you should be, you know, 20 bucks higher on the retail for this, for this ASIN because the pricing was just so low. So that's part of the challenge in Canada. Uh, and this is, all, all, this is, by the way, this is just kind of gut and experience feelings because, as you know, nobody's ever going to tell you that. And no vendor managers knows about the back, the back end of these things, right? Right. Did you find um, the same thing in Europe? Uh, less in Europe, to be yeah. honest with you. I think I think retails are well. Europe is another beast altogether, right? Europe has the, the, each country has its own PNL, and uh, depending on how you set up the back end, you can have goods moving in. I call it the back end from, let's say, Germany to France, and then they ship from France to the end consumer. The other setup in Europe is you promote an item in France and it's shipped from Germany into France. So you have to know what Amazon is doing. <laughs> and the, the best person to know that is the Luxembourg team, uh, the, 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 the backend teams in Luxembourg. And we can do a whole podcast on yeah, yeah. who to go to with Amazon. Right. But there's a team of very sharp, smart, well, actually, the people at Amazon, from my experience, 90% of them are very smart, very cool, and very good as, at what they do. But they, they do know their piece. And whether they tell us they don't know the other pieces or they really don't, I don't know. But they're very good people to work with. And the Luxembourg people can help you figure out how your flow, how your goods flow within Europe. And then you get into the Brexit thing and what does it do with UK? Right. So it gets <laughs> it gets a little complex. But once you've figured it out, your the, the way your some of your main ASINs flow, then you've you know you know more than most of the people in and outside of Amazon. And this is how you can get ahead of the competition, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I've dealt with all kinds of suppliers in the sense that some have Amazon teams that, you know, like, like you folks had a very robust team led by you. And then I deal with other suppliers that have like a sales rep. They don't have an analyst. It, it, we go mm -hmm. kind of soup the nuts on like sophistication. How do you see... Amazon fitting like it's not a let it it's not a set it and forget it program. No. What what are some of the challenges you think brands have? Like you know the first thing is hey we're on Amazon let's go celebrate. Where do you where have you seen it fall apart after that? Or what suggestions would you have for brands to make sure that they're getting the the full value out of Amazon? Because it's a little bit one of those beasts where people say I have Amazon sales but I don't think I'm making any money or I'm not sure if I am. Yeah. And that's the big question, right? Do you make money on Amazon and should you be on Amazon? And I think the answer depends on the business that you have and on the product that you sell. So if you're in the toys business, let's say, right, you have to be on Amazon. This is not a necessary evil. You have to be on Amazon because, you know, we buy a lot of toys on Amazon. If you're in the electronics business, if you're in the uh, home, home, uh, home supplies business, I think you have to be on Amazon or Wayfair, but I mean, that's another, that's another conversation. Mm -hmm. um, I think that if you, I mean, for some people, Amazon will be a necessary evil, right? Because, so I call it the, the halo effect. It's not, it's not necessarily because you're not selling stuff on Amazon, that Amazon doesn't help you on the marketing side. And it's, and for me, Doug, it's not as much about the marketing straight to your consumer, but from my experience, what happened, let's say just anecdotally in, in, in Italy, uh, we found distributors that wanted to sell our toys in Italy because they saw it on Amazon, right? So it's kind of the go-to place where people have a feel of a, an industry in the consumer goods business or whatever other businesses that's consumer related. 
and they're going to pick up on some items that they like and the, the some reviews are going to carry into their home country and they're going to go, you know, the phone could ring up and say, hey, I want to distribute your line of business here because I see it's happening. So for me, there's a there's a what I call the ha the halo. I think it's halo mm -hmm. effect. Excuse my French there. The halo effect of Amazon. So it's not only the sale itself, it's the visibility it gives brands. And to answer your first question on what's the main challenge, for me, the main challenge on Amazon is data. It's a notion of data that gets that gets thrown at you every day. And most people just freeze in front of that wall of data. And then what do I do with it? And you know, I think people today were we have a, a, a an attention span that's very very short. So Amazon need deep focused work, right? You got to be an inch wide and a mile deep on Amazon, and it's like a marathon, right? If you get into a marathon and you're at your first k and you think about the forty second, you will not last. Trust me, you will not that get to the to the to the finish line. If you take it five kilometers at a time, my my first k, let's get to five, let's get to ten. Next thing you know, you're going to be at 30, 35, and you're going to go, oh, there's seven left to do. I'm done, right? So it's the same kind of principle and approach that I tell my team and the guys I work with. It's you got to bite piece it and the 80 20 rule is what you got to look for right so look at the 20% of your ASINs look 20% of your market 20% of the countries work on those and then if you get to the others and once you get to the others then's how you build and you flywheel the uh, the ASIN so the data wave is what i call the most challenging part of amazon there doug yeah I I agree with that. I mean, we we work with all kinds of Amazon or all types of Amazon data with our suppliers here at Crunchbox. I, what I find too, and, and again, with chatting with folks who are, you know, a couple inches wide and a mile deep with uh, with their Amazon business, it's a it is a language all on its own. Like I'm reading posts on LinkedIn here. They're talking about 1P, 3P, CPC, CAP, uh, Amazon Marketing Services. Like the more I learn about Amazon, the less I know. Does that make yeah. sense? It's just like, I realize like this, okay, this isn't just one page. This is an entire chapter, 200 pages long. I don't even understand the acronyms. Yeah. And, and in the, in the, so, so again, I'm not from the digital world, but I feel like in any industry, people tend to over complexify things, right? People like to talk about acronyms and people, and I, I mean, for me, and, and I, like, I like simple things. I like simple things. I like to simplify things. And there's a way to simplify an Amazon business. It's not that difficult and that complex. And it's like any other business, right? Uh, I mean, if you, if you don't understand, probably the person that tried to explain it to you did not either. And there's, there's, there's a lot of that in Amazon because there's just so much limited human intervention during the process. Every, you know, most of the people try to get into the system and figuring out what people don't understand. And this is probably a good segue into my, my, my overruling uh, uh, rule, if you will, with Amazon is find the humans, find the individual, find the vendor manager, go meet him or her. And, and get there's tons of humans behind this so-called algorithm. People call it the algorithm. It's, I don't think it's even that, to be honest with you. There's tons of humans behind the machine, tons of humans to speak with. You got to find the right ones. You got to get to your vendor manager. If you want to run a successful business, whether it's in the U.S. or in Canada, you got to get to your in-stock manager. Because for me, the success of Amazon is about two things. Amazon being in stock all the time and the right retail. If you can get Amazon to be at the right retail for your end users, right? Yes. And, and you can have them to be in stock 95% of the time because of the flywheel you're going to create on these ASINs. Because once you've created a flywheel, if it's out of stock for three months, it's going to come back. It's not going to get the same position in the same real estate as it had before. I mean, people can argue with me on this. I speak from experience. If you get it to flywheel, if you get into a top 100 bestseller or if or if you get the holy grail, which is the bestseller in a category, you have to be in stock as long as you can. So your best friend 
should be your in-stock manager, which is working side to side with your vendor manager. So you got to get to these guys. And there's different ways to get to these guys, whether it's through your Amazon marketing uh, people, you get you get through them and uh, and you ask them to meet your vendor manager. If, if you're in Canada, unfortunately, they're more difficult to get to. I mean, this was pre-COVID, actually. I think they, they started to travel a little bit more, the Amazon guys. But the vendor managers, at least in the toys category in Canada, used to come to Toronto once every three months. It used to be a junior that that just wanted to work its way up into the Amazon uh, infrastructure. So didn't know really much about the business, didn't have any pull internally. You could feel it. And they used to change every six months. Right. And they still change very often. I mean, they're, you, you're not, you're not going to get a vendor manager in for more than two years. Very rare. And this is why you got to not only know the vendor manager, get to know the anchor relationships, the anchor, ma the vendor manager's boss, the, 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 the manager of the vendor managers, and then the, um, how do they call the category leader, the cat lead. You got to get to these guys. And if you're an analyst working on Amazon, bring your VP. These guys are going to go with titles. I mean, you know, it's like, like the classic. Bring your CEO, bring your CMO, bring your VP, go to Seattle. If you haven't been to Seattle and you have a dot-com business as a 1P, there's an issue. Haven't done your job properly, in my view, in my view at least. You got to get to Seattle once or twice a year if you're doing 20, 30 million plus peacocks. Peacocks, Doug, is product cost of goods sold. Right. Not to throw another acronym in this in the mix. <laughs> uh, what, now, you're, you're, uh, the vendor you were working with that had, you know, they had a significant Amazon business and toys by far is a, a, a significant category on Amazon. Like you said, if you're a toy manufacturer, you got to be there. What about for other categories where, you know, they're not as hot or not as big a, a focus for Amazon, like some of the customers you might have worked in, with at your business, have you seen you get the same response or would the tactic be a little bit different? Do you got to earn that seat at the table or what's that feel like and, and look like on your end today? So if you're a one piece seller, if you're on vendor central, so this is where I draw the line. So vendor sent, if, if someone at Amazon sent you an invite to open a vendor central account and that either your source uh, direct import or domestically uh, to Amazon as a first party seller, you should know someone and you should be able to send an email to someone that not, not that you know, but that knows you, which is a very big difference, right? You got to make sure that these guys know you and you have to respect their relationship. These guys have KPIs, which, which you need to understand, right? They're, they're measured on new selection. They're measured on profitability, net PPM and stuff like that. So you got to work with these guys as a partner to get to their KPIs. And you know what? You're going to get to yours at the same time. So it's a partnership. I've seen, you know, I've seen companies. This one was a guy in the UK who was just, you know, he was just getting the PO, shipping to Amazon. And his, his um, perception was that there was no one at Amazon, right? So he just fulfills the POs. And when we came to Amazon to ask them to do some, you know, strategy, get the new products and get better real estate, do best deals and do some, you know, the, so some prime deal of the day with these guys, they were reluctant because they just did not feel that it was, it was a partnership. So there's a, there's a few guys thinking that way. And by the way, this is, this not only applies to Amazon, right? It applies to other retailers, obviously. Absolutely. But, you got to build a relationship with these guys and they're, you know, you know, they're asked, they're, they're going to ask for marketing dollars. So, you know, everything is negotiable. You can negotiate like you, 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 we could do a whole podcast on 20 minutes on how to, what freebies can you get with Amazon? If you're ready to be a partner and to build the brand sustainably on Amazon, right? Even though building brands on Amazon, it's, and again, another, another podcast we could do, I'm not, I'm not convinced you can build, brands on Amazon. It's more of an items business. So you can build an item. You can build a nascent. Can you build the brand a little bit? Yes. Uh, but not as well as when you're in the real world and you get into in front of a shelf and, you know, you're going to sell the shower curtain and then you're going to sell the the, the, the the soap with it and everything else, right? That that you can mm -hmm. sell. It's more it's it's more difficult on Amazon. I like your uh, point earlier, though. It's, almost, it's, it's really like a, a massive catalog. It's the Expedia of of flights, right? So I want to buy a table. I want to buy a lamp, like the light I have here for this podcast. 
I can go to Amazon and I can see all the different vendors, all the different brands, their ratings and everything. But I may be so impulsive or I may be going to a store tomorrow and go, I just want to research which one I want to get before I go there. Because it is a consolidator of all of all vendors. There's very few retailers that would have the same selection as Amazon. So I, I, I like that point you made earlier. Like the reason to do business with Amazon is not always just to drive profits on Amazon. Yes, you want to be profitable. But two, there are some ancillary benefits from a marketing product positioning rating standpoint that could spill over to to your other side of the business, whether that's their own direct to consumer business or whether that's um, other retailers that they're in. So what I've heard from you, go ahead. I, 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 I think at the minimum, at the minimum, if a manufacturer or a brand owner is on Amazon, let's say in the US or in Europe, in the main markets, and doesn't at least cover its cost in terms of visibility, there's there's an issue. Yeah. There's a way you can make money. If obviously, you know, in, uh, talking in general, there's a way to make, you know, to, to make this business sustainable and then add on top of that the fact that people search as much on Google as they do on Amazon when it comes to, you know, research sure. for products. So there's a way to, there's a way to do that. But you, you need you need to be focused. You need focus yeah. and you need to be patient. Right. Brand registry. And oh, my God. It, I mean, there's there's so many complexities into this thing. But once you figure it out, you will have figured it out better than your neighbor. Right. Right. And once you're in. You're in, so that's a barrier to entry. Yeah, like I think what, what we've uh, we've heard today. If I'm a VP of sales, I, I'm gonna I need to treat Amazon like I treat Walmart, Best Buy, Home Depot, Lowe's, etc. You insert retailer name there. It's the same kind of relationships I want to build, even though they don't have any bricks and mortar stores that are selling the product. It's the same process. It's the same investment, right? It might be even more investment mm-hmm. because it's a little bit more intricate for lack of a better word to fully understand the complexities behind it and having an expert like you or someone on their team that understands that landscape is invaluable because you do need to know i like that other word you said they need to know you you need to know them but they need to know you as well um i like fully you want to understand their kpis which is any good national sales or account manager should know what their retailer or buyer or merchant's KPIs are so they can align to those. And, you know, if you can drive their KPIs and you have alignment, you're going to do that for your, for your business as well. I think we've covered a lot of ground today. And I think look, we got probably about 25 other podcasts that we can do after this one. Cause I didn't even, didn't even get into things like, how do you know that you have the buy box or what are some of the hints and tips that we can give companies that just ensure that, all the time they've invested in building their Amazon business that they're actually going to benefit from it at the, at the, at the most. And then also just talk a little bit more about the data as we were talking earlier about sourcing data versus manufacturing data, making sure they're looking at the right information and get a little bit more into that and kind of some of the reporting that you found valuable in your, your roles and in your, your company today, that'll just help them at least get down, down the path a little bit. So Guillaume, thanks for joining me today. I, I feel like we just scratched the surface. So hopefully you'll come back and we'll do a couple more. Maybe we can get one a month and just start chipping away at it and provide all the listeners today with some uh, added value on Amazon. So for everyone on, uh, this will stream on LinkedIn, YouTube. Uh, we'll make a podcast recording of it. I'm going to post it on LinkedIn with Guillaume's contact information, his business information. Feel free to send us both a question if you have anything top of mind out there after you watch this and We'll get back to you with the answer. So thanks, everyone, for watching. I appreciate it. Guillaume, thanks for your time today and look forward to the next podcast. Have a good day. Bye-bye. You too. Bye-bye.